All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I expect we'll get a few others logging on as we get rolling. Um, welcome, and thank you all for taking the time to join us for um, the uh, for our webinar today as part of our Nature Play Begins at Your Zoo and Aquarium program uh, presented in partnership with the Children and Nature Network. Today we'll be talking about framing family facilitation and really helping uh, caregivers and adults become play partners and facilitators in our work at our zoos and aquariums and beyond. Um, I am Amy Rutherford. I'm the Director of Professional Development and Public Engagement at AZA um, and pleased to welcome you all here. Um, and sometimes get kisses from kangaroos. <laughs> um, joining mm -hmm. us on the call will be, um, as presenters, will be Monica Lopez McGee, who's the Director of Family Initiatives at Children and Nature Network, and Marilyn Brink, the Manager of Professional Development at, and Early Childhood at the Chicago Zoological Society's Brookfield Zoo. I would like to extend a very big thank you to uh, to Disney for their funding of AZA's Nature Play Begins at Your Zoo and Aquarium initiative, and especially uh, for their funding of our mini grants program, which I believe many of you are recipients. Um, as well as a thank you to Monica and Marilyn for sharing their expertise and perspectives and experience with you. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. We are recording this session, and it will be posted on the AZA YouTube channel with a link shared on our uh, Nature Play Begins webpage on our website as well as shared out through the nature play group on the AZA network and so if you're not already part of that group I would suggest you go join uh, shortly after this call to make sure you're up to date on all the resources and, and sharing possibilities for that community we will be using the chat function. If you see on the right-hand side of your screen on your GoToWebinar control panel, you should see an option to expand the chat function. And you'll see a chat from me that says we will use uh, this to share questions with the presenters. So you are all muted right now just to keep any um, accidental background noise, radio calls, etc. cetera, uh, to a minimum. But if you have questions during the call that you'd like to share, we'll go ahead and um, receive them through that chat box. You can send them to everybody or you can send them uh, directly to me at the AZA uh, login. And then at the end, we will go ahead and unmute everybody. Um, and as long as that works, we'll go ahead and allow you to ask questions as well as uh, I will also share the questions that came through the chat box. Um, if people feel more comfortable or depending on their technological connections are best able to share that way. Uh, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Monica to go ahead and get started with our presentation. Hello, thank you, Amy. I'm excited to be here. I'm Monica Lopez McGee, and I joined uh, the Children and Nature Network just a, a couple months ago, and am uh, kind of immersed. I've had, led family nature clubs of my own um, with friends and and family members, and uh, have a background also in environmental education. So I'm looking forward to sharing some some ideas and tricks that have worked for for me, and some of the research behind why we want to engage families. So often, um, hopefully each of you is is incorporating nature play, and as we think, consider this, like why bring on families and parents and caregivers, and what the studies have really shown is that um, that influence between parents and children is bi-directional. So we often think of parents or caregivers as teaching uh, children, but we don't often consider that the children can be the the, the providers of, of learning opportunities and being able to transfer information um, in, in the other direction and transfer also there's been studies that have shown that this can be transferred also between generations and what they see is that it becomes it's a habit building uh, element that is created in our lives and so knowing that family is important we want to invite parents and caregivers into the play atmosphere and oftentimes this changes the dynamic of a typical camp or or session where you're only working with the children and so we want to make the parents feel involved and why what are some of the um, some inspiration points to um, remind us of why we do this 
is that the parents are the decision makers. If we can give them a positive experience, then they're going to be the ones that make the decisions to bring, you know, to engage again at your zoo or aquarium and encourage that repeat um, participation. It's also an opportunity to educate a new audience. We can't make any assumptions about knowledge or experiences parents have in the outdoors or nature play. And through this, we also have opportunities to create family bonds and family memories from people taking time out to, to give each other their whole attention. So as we consider this, we want to think, how do we do this? And before, parents oftentimes have fears associated with open, unstructured play. So we want to be sure that we're prepared. We want to, if you are doing this on site, then you'll be looking at some of the some of the ways that you've structured your space and I know that Marilyn is going to go into more specifics about that but some zoos and aquariums are taking families off-site and it seems really intuitive but we want to make sure that we visit that site ahead of time and oftentimes our schedules get busy and we feel confident that we're going to take um, take families to a new location, but keeping in mind of what, what exists at those sites, if there's existing hazards, um, or is there open space for games or quiet spots. So considering what, time of, what type of exploration you want to lead and what, how that space is conducive to that. In thinking about this, so then we're headed outside and we want to involve the parents. We often uh, tell students or youth to get off their phone, but we want to invite the parents. So as we start to create this space, we want to remind the parents that they are also invited to spend the time outdoors, that this is not only a time for their children, but a time for them. And some of the wording that I like to use is like, give your child the gift of your attention. You know, sometimes we forget that and they, the, the parents can get easily distracted and reminding them to be a role model for, for stepping away from their busy lives and to turn off and play with us. Um, I like to say that, you know, sometimes parents or caregivers are the guilty parties in uh, overuse of screen time during these activities because they think of it as a break. And I like to say that the cell phones are for, for taking pictures and that we want to encourage their involvement. So this is in terms of parents. What about the children? So, oh, sorry. So we also want to, as, as parents are getting involved, one of the fears is that they're not informed on this topic or they're not going to be able to identify that bugs. And, and what we want to let them know is that there's no right or wrong answers. We want to, that this is about curiosity, exploration, about them getting down low with their children and playing. And if they do find that they have questions, that their child has questions, that it's okay to say, I don't know. And then that we can also popcorn questions, which means like if there's a question that we're unaware of, let's, let's bring it up to the group because somebody else might have that question. And we can pop it around to see who else might have insight on that. And then we have our, 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 our children. And so a Montessori statement is the limit for freedom is respect for yourself and others. And we can extend that into nature. And so when we try to think of how do we create structure and set up boundaries outdoors, we want to, we want to create an open environment where, where youth are encouraged to play, to climb, to um, get muddy and, and build. And so we want to ensure that they're invited to play. And when we're able to frame that at the beginning of a session, then the parents also know that we're encouraging that so that they start, because you want to, as you're explaining this to the children, you're giving the parents the, or caregivers the framework for how to engage also outdoors. Because too often we're, we're kind of left with moments of don't touch that. And instead we want to say, oh, how does that feel? How can, you know, how can we explore that? And always reminding um, students or children, if, you know, how do you feel at any given time? 
you know, are you in touch? How does your body feel? Are you in touch with your space? How, you know, are you are you in a safe place versus telling that or versus um, letting them know what is their limits or boundaries within reason <laughs> of what's safe. And then as we consider um, also bringing in the the parents and the children, we want to think of what's our role as a facilitator. And keeping in mind that, that the children are the lead, you're there to guide and encourage their observation, to ask open-ended questions to that don't have a right or a wrong answer. We want to model behavior. I like to say that you want to share your enthusiasm. Whatever enthusiasm level you're at, assume that parents will be at half that level. So you want to amp it up as much as you can. We also want to let the environment around us be a facilitator of our of the play. So that goes back to ensuring ahead of time that the that the area is safe, is a safe space, and knowing what, if any, are boundaries for that area. And then most importantly, after that, we want to step aside and just allow for the play. That's one of, it seems really straightforward, but sometimes it's hard to do that. We have a, there's a tendency to want to organize and to provide information and reminding ourselves that when we step aside that that curiosity and that wonder and exploration can happen where quite a bit of learning exists. You might find a situation where there is a pro, uh, you know something that appears problematic. When we have a, an entire family entity there, you know, let the parent or the caregiver be the lead. Sometimes they know their child best. They know their child best and how to navigate those situations. If you find you must get involved, you know, take a step back just to recognize, to ask questions. What happened? Um, what do you think happened? How could we? How could this be prevented? Or how could we move forward and creating some of our some safe play? And so keeping in mind, um, we don't ever want anyone to feel as though they did something wrong. And knowing that if someone has an experience, particularly the parent or caregiver, where they felt that they were in the wrong, that they're less likely to return. And we want to ensure that repeat visit. After... Um, so you've led the activities. We want to be sure, we want to empower the parents to continue, and the caregivers to continue this open nature play. So is there a skill that they left with? Once again, teaching them to get down on the ground and play with their with their child. Um, an open ended question you can leave them with, or a challenge um, that you might frame of the experience you had, so that they can continue that giving them options for nearby locations uh, where they can visit to continue the play, and also being sure to share your calendar of events so that they know when your next activity is to join in. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to, <laughs> to Marilyn to share some, uh, some specifics about how they're implementing some of these ideas at uh, the Brookfield Zoo. Good morning or afternoon, wherever you're coming to this webinar from. I'm, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to talk about family nature play, um, kind of from the perspective of how um, we engage with families at the Brookfield Zoo and specifically at the Hamill Family Play Zoo, which I'll talk a little bit about as we're moving through some of the, um, the slides. As Monica and I were talking about um, the different aspects of thinking about family nature play, it kind of seems to me that there's some ingredients, as she's pointed out in, in her slides, uh, that go into our thinking as we're planning for some of these um, experiences and opportunities, and even some of the settings that, that we're designing um, in our program. So I thought we'd kind of think about ingredients that make for a, a effective program, not that they're, um, they're a cookbook kind of thing, that, that means that there's no chance for flexibility. Um, so they're just ingredients that are important for us to consider when we're thinking of families coming into any of our settings. Do I ask you to advance, or how is this going to work? I'll be advancing oh, okay. this. Okay, great, great, great. 
So, um, so one of the um, the pieces that are that have been part of the ingredients that have gone into the thinking that we'll use um, at uh, Brookfield Zoo is coming from these four different pictures that are up here. So the the field of conservation psychology, which talks about the connection between humans and nature, has been one that's been founded at Brookfield Zoo, but also one that very much informs our thinking. We know that these little children will be the future caregivers of our Earth. And while it's not their job to save the earth now, we know that they need to have a chance to fall in love with it and make those connections between themselves and those, those animals and those plants and that world around them. So, so that thinking really is, is what we take use as our lens to begin to look at a space or think about a program or even think about an interaction we're going to have with a family. Right on the right on the below um, is what came out of the conservation psychology field, and that's our Chicago Zoological Society learning strategy. We have three outcomes that we plan around with our programs and our settings and our spaces. And one of those um, outcomes is fostering empathy between yourself and living things. It's also a very typical pro-social skill that young children are developing, being kind to others, trying to put themselves in the other shoes. So when they see a worm on the sidewalk and it's drying up, that the, the kindest thing to do for that animal is put it back in its home. So picking it up and putting it back in the grass fosters empathy for that, that the living thing that's there um, in the earth. The second outcome we plan around is making connections between yourself and living things. So if it's true for children, it's true for, for, the, for the world around them, for the plants and the animals. So they, uh, well, maybe not so much for plants, but animals um, live in families. They have homes. They have food. They have behaviors they, um, they enjoy doing. They have um, um, habitats that they live in or homes of that sort. So, so we try to make connections between what the child has in their life and the animal has. And again, it kind of comes back to that, that first outcome of fostering empathy. You can put yourself in the shoes of a squirrel if you're able to watch how they move, look where they live, see how they, they make their homes. Similar, they're right there in your neighborhood, so that's a great animal for a child, a young child to make a connection with. The third outcome is um, a, word, a phrase called taking action. And for really young kids, it's really practicing caring behaviors. So what can the child leave from your, with your, from your setting, from your space, from your program, whatever it is you're, you're doing for family nature play, that they can maybe take back to their home, to their neighborhood, to their patch of grass that's near their, their home. So sometimes it's a bird feeder. Sometimes it's making tote boats. Sometimes it's sticking um, bird silhouettes in the window so the migratory bird sees and the birds don't fly into the window. So some, something that a ch young child can do that's, that's helping care for the earth in a very uh, developmentally appropriate way. Um, we, get, we get kind of our, our um, um, information and, and um, ideas from thinking about um, what growing young minds um, and kids dig dirt. Two papers that kind of talked about different ways that adult facilitators can think about their role in supporting these young explorers, these young discoverers, alongside their families. Um, we consider the families the people that are driving the car or pulling the wagon into our organizations and our institutions and our spaces, and they're as much a part of this play as the child. So, um, so we kind of are guided by those kind of foundations as part of our, our major ingredients for where we plan from. Just to really uh, quickly, just to share a little bit about the Hamill Family Play Zoo, which um, we're excited this year to be celebrating our 10th anniversary. The exhibit opened in 2001, and it was designed to make the, the zoo experience a more intimate, um, authentic, hands-on experience for young kids and families. Zoos are, can often, in our organizations, can be big places to walk around, and often they're looking through fences, they're looking far away, and not getting to have the really first-hand experience that the families may have planned for. So some of the, the founding principles behind the Hamill Family Play Zoo are, have been part of those that slide I previously showed that helped develop um, this exhibit inside and out for young children to have um, these first-hand experiences up close to nature, um, playing in nature, becoming a bird, becoming a lemur, becoming um, a different animal that might be in the exhibit, caring for the animals, um, and just having those experiences that are right for their age to um, be able to act on their environment. Out of this, our Nature Start Professional Development Program um, evolved, and it's a pro program for educators, informal educators in zoos, aquariums, nature centers, any informal setting that are working with young children and families around nature-based early learning and play. So um, that, that's just a little, a little bit of our framework. You don't have to have an exhibit like this, and even in our, 
our course, which has been offered through AZA. Um, we don't really come to visit the place until well into the program because we don't want people to think that that's the kind of space that you have to have to do nature play. It can be right outside your door. Some, okay, that sounds fine. That's good. So one of the um, another one of those 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 frameworks or ingredients that goes into the thinking are some of these ideas. Um, and again, a, a few things that that um, Monica's already addressed. Um, and I'll just go right to the bottom corner: the how do grown-ups play? So what what is there? What's the role for the grown-up in this space? And and really, sometimes it's really taking pictures of their children children playing in ways that they may not have seen before. They really you really give parents a chance to see how smart their kids are, how competent they are, how much they already know about um, the world and how to engage with it. So I think that that's that's a nice thing to do, but for some parents, it's kind of a chance to reconnect with early play experiences they had and, uh, and sharing that with their child. So making sure that there's, there's um, comfortable areas for the adults to be, that children may not necessarily notice that there's sun and not shade and those kinds of things, that there's stumps to sit on or whatever. Sometimes adults don't get right down on the ground. Sometimes they like to be up a little bit more. Where are some places that we can make the adults feel like they can be comfortable too so that they're not leaning over the kids in that kind of power on kind of way of, um, it's also not comfortable to bend over and lean on kids. Could you go back to that slide a second, Monica, please? The other, um, other couple ideas are, um, one of the activities we actually do in our Nature Star training is um, up on the right hand corner you see those, um, those grown-ups, we call those adults that come with kids grown-ups because we don't often know if they're parents or caregivers or other family members. Um, we have these kids and they're the sizes of two-year-olds, four-year-olds, and six-year-olds, and um, the eyes are punched out of them, so we want you to really get to that level and see through those eyes how the child seeing your experience or your setting. Often um, when we look at it from our adult level, um, we're looking over the space and a child will see like what, what's right in front of them. So one of the, um, the good ways, as Monica talked about, going out to your space and checking it out ahead of time, actually get down to a child's level and see what they see when they're those ages of the, the groups that are coming or the families that are coming out to your area. Yeah. Are those, if you're looking over the grasses, do you see things beyond that or does the child just see the grasses? What are they noticing? Who's living on the grasses? Who's living down on the ground? So that's kind of a good good way to kind of really get a feel for what the child might notice in your space, safety-wise, but also um, the richness of the environment. The other um, idea is to think about is to become familiar with how young children learn and experience the world making sure that if this is a place that they can engage and, and use, you know, do discovery, do exploration, do investigation, that you, you've kind of looked at that from that, those, those eyes. Um, we, we say that the environments have affordances, and the child will see the affordances in an environment often in very different ways that adults can, and you might find yourself saying, oh, we never thought the kids would do that. So as you're checking for safety, as you're checking for the richness of the environment and the, the different elements that might be there, making sure you're supporting that they need to be act on their environment and touch it, move it, sometimes taste it, maybe that's not appropriate, so know, know about that, smell it, see it, all those ways of experiencing their environment. So that's how young children learn. They learn through their senses and from acting on the environment. So that's another lens to use when you're um, looking at spaces and creating programs for families. Okay, now I'm ready. So this kind of goes back to the, again, we've been touching on this point of preparation. Um, what, what, what's your setting going to be like? We know where we are in Chicago that while we're having a beautiful fall now and we've had a lovely summer, we don't often have all of our nature play experiences taking place outside. Um, and for some children in some neighborhoods, the nature that's outside may not always be a safe place to experience it. So it's wonderful to have plants and animals and sensory materials and nature experiences indoors as well. We also know that really young children um, experience things through their dramatic play. So dressing up in a bird costume or putting on a, a, some sort of a, a prop or, or material that can, can replicate the way an animal might move, adding tails around their waist for them to play in color. They'll play in different ways when they're making a connection to the animals in those ways. So I, so I really with very young children, we want to make sure we have lots of opportunities for them to have those experiences indoors as well as out. Great for them to be outside. Sometimes the weather doesn't agree with it. Our programs can still go on indoors. So as we prepare the setting, 
we're thinking about what's the invitation to play. This kind of gives those grown-ups a little clue of how the child might use the space. Um, and also with young children, we know that, that the idea of sharing means you can divide it. Otherwise, you take turns with it. So what you see in the bottom corner are two sensory bins for two little children. Now, they might be able to play in the same bin at the same time, but for some age groups, that's going to cause a problem. So we want to have multiple opportunities, and maybe they're even farther apart than this, um, that where they can play. Because if you can take turns with it, there's, there's one object. If you share it, you can divide it. And it's pretty hard to share a sensory bin when your hands are close to another child. So we try to make an environment where the kids can be successful in their play and the parents don't have to spend a lot of time managing their behavior. That kind of takes away from the play. And sometimes for some parents, it can really put them on the spot that they might perceive their child to misbehave in their settings. And really, they're just doing what 15-month-olds do. They explore by touching and, and moving things around. So we try to plan for those in our environment. So know the, the age group that you're planning for, and then your setting can kind of reflect that. Um, finding places for those grown-ups as well as the kids to engage um, helps the parents know, know how to play and be there to support the play. Some other additional ways to do invitations are things like um, pathways or um, tree cookie paths or steps or just the way the placement of the materials are, are put out. Again, the pictures on the right-hand side are for very young children that are having some of these early nature play experiences. Um, we are not always sure what they're going to um, find interesting in the environment. We usually have a lot of things like baskets and um, other totes that they can fill and move. We know that they're, they're learning to move, they're moving all around, and sometimes they're so curious about the moving part that they, they, may not, they may walk right by something that you have out. So if we put out baskets in different containers for them to fill and empty, um, they're getting all those experiences, they're getting a lot of tactile play, um, their parents also get a, an idea of, of how the child can play, and we invite them to really watch what they're choosing, how they're filling their basket. Is it too full? Does it spill over? These little guys in the middle picture have found the sticks, and there's, these are just boards that have holes drilled in them, and they're, um, they're filling the, the, the holes with um, the sticks. A parent gets really excited and proud when their child does that sort of play and is maybe more likely to support it back at home or, or out in, if they take a walk around the block and they notice some sticks, now they're comfortable having their child actually pick up a stick and play with it in a way that's, that's, that's safe and, and curious. So I'm um, thinking about the way you have even place little objects on the floor for an invitation to come into a little area to play and that can be outside as well. What are your invitations to these little nooks and crannies that the kids like to find and how do we create those pathways that, that offer those invitations? And just a point, and we won't go back to the slide, but you might have noticed on the slide at the bottom that there was also some signage. So it also gives parents um, some information about what, what, what are some possibilities for play in that setting. They don't want their kids to do things wrong, so we want to make sure we let them know that your child might like this or this or this, just as ideas. Sometimes they're, they're starters. For some parents that come to some of our nature play settings this, or grandparents, this might be the first time they've come to a place like this and they may not exactly know, you know, that, that it's okay for the children to do different things. Um, that another way that we try to have invitations in the setting are thinking about the different ways children and adults like to explore and discover. So do they like to think about it from an artistic perspective? This little girl is um, using mud to attach shells to the tree. So the invitation is just the materials that are out of those baskets right in front of the tree. This Noe said this to her to do. She just picked it up and started doing it. So um, uh, she may have just lined them up on the ground. She may have done whatever she wanted. But, um, but this, was, this was an affordance that this tree kind of said to her, stick stuff on me. So thinking about how we can use our, our, our natural elements that are in our settings in ways that offer children that may, may see it in a more creative, artistic way, um, that opportunity to do that as well. Um, the picture on the right is just kind of a reminder that, that again, dramatic play is one of the highest levels of, of um, imagination and creativity um, in young children, and how they, they are able to act out and imagine through their play is really a gift to give them the opportunity to do that. These kinds of things are often clues to parents to start up a conversation like, hey, I wonder where we could go in our boat, kind of thing. So that, that those are another, those kinds of props are really good um, inspirations for the parents to have an idea 
most parents have probably been on a boat, gone somewhere on a boat, so these are things that they also have in their, um, their kind of toolkit of, or their memory bank of what they've done as a child. Um, some of these other things, the, the one of the play areas on the right is a great space for these bigger, like the grown-ups that are there to play. The young kids you see are down in the sand. The grown-ups are a little more comfortable on those rocks. And so they're there supporting the play, engaged in the play, maybe probably leaning over, doing some building themselves. They're just up a little higher than the kids are. Um, so we just try to think about who's coming into the setting and how do we make it comfortable and inviting for, for the different family members or, or, or um, participants that are coming. Some other ways to um, to invitations to in your setting is just the loose parts idea, and you probably are very familiar with you know having loose parts and providing loose parts, um, and then maybe adding some accessories. You see the girl in the bigger picture. Also, we've added some some of the animals, the resin animals for the play. Um, there, she might have been rolling pine cones down the um, the boards ahead of time, and then when the animals come out, she's using the animals in, in a different way. It changes the play. Um, almost completely when we when we change the type of props that are, that are put in the setting and that's really inviting especially as these players get to be a little older they're they're really engaged in ways that, that also show to their parents that they know a lot about animals they know about animal families they might even know animals that live in similar um, habitats together and so they'll they'll play out those kinds of experiences one of the um, the other aspects is kind of the um, we think about it from a power perspective so there's there's three ways to think about power in our settings. We can power on, we can power for, and we can power with. When we power on, we kind of we try to use those, save those for safety issues. So we, if there's a child climbing on a fence in, in an unsafe area, we'll we'll remind them that you know the fences are there to keep to protect us from from going into those areas. So we're going to kind of try to look through the fences and kind of look at whatever our fences look like, so you actually could see through them or where some openings that were not hindered by a fence. If there's um, props and materials like the spray bottle the, the parents have up there, this again invites the parents to be involved and engaged in the play. We have some other um, squeeze bottles that are more for the young child, but I wanted to use this picture to show that, that for the parent, this is a wonderful way for that parent to power for and with their child, so they're sharing the experience of watering the plant. It's important for the plant in the soil that the, the plant gets gently sprayed, and the parent can do that when they have a prop that fits them as well. Um, we also think about placement. In the picture on the bottom, we're thinking about where the adult places their own body. So again, trying to get the adult as much as we can on the child's level to share these experiences so they're, they're not using their, their position in the, um, in the engagement as a power. So they're not leaning over them or towering over them, but squatting down and getting lower. And I know it's not comfortable for all family members, and sometimes as grandparents we make sure, well, always, we make sure that we have stumps or chairs or low, low places to sit rocks so that people can get as close as they can to the child's level and still be comfortable being able to get up. In this case, this, uh, um, one of our staff is sharing an animal, meeting an animal with these kids. So she's right down there so the kids can touch right at their level. So positions of ourselves in these spaces are, are really important to remember and to notice when you're looking at, are the adults just standing? Are they towering over? Are they able to squat down or bend down or sit down um, where the play is happening? Again, these, we're thinking back about the, the role of the adult. Um, so we're allowing for some of this, this uninterrupted place where the adults are there as supporters. Um, in this case, you know, it's clear that this, this parent is there to support. This is kind of a risk taking. She's up probably on a three and a half foot maybe stump. It started lower, she moved up, and as, she got, as the little child walked up to the taller stumps, mom moved right in and was able to give her a hand and assist her all the way to the end where she was able to jump off by herself. So, um, so that, that made that parent feel very proud of her child's competence and, and kind of risk taking and, uh, and she did such a, you know, she was so, so comfortable being up there um, that the next time she climbed up she got even farther along on those stumps um, because her mom was watching her and she knew she'd be safe. So those are, that's just a great role for an adult in that setting as well. We see a mom in the other picture kind of helping the girls build a fort. So um, that's great. We, um, in our setting, we have places for the, the grown-ups to sit and, again, watch the kids be creative and problem-solve. Sometimes we have to be, walk that fine line as grown-ups of, of, of coming up with too many answers and giving too many directions. This is clearly an activity the kids could do to, together, 
but it's great when a parent can engage in that play and support it and also show to their children that they enjoy building forts as much as the kids do. So, um, so this is, a, I thought, a really nice example of a way that this, this mom found to um, be involved in the, the play. I wonder how we could get this to stand up, what could we use, what tools are out here, look around, bring something over, and the, the, the finished product, is the, the girls made this lovely tent where they think they were having a snack or something underneath. So, um, so the role of that adult could be one to support and then, then move back or, or stay involved in the play if they're, if they're in a playful mood, um, not taking over the play or, or directing it in any um, way for an end product. These are just some more examples of, of positions. So um, um, again, the, uh, the grown-up that's in the picture next to the, um, the staff member, the play partner at the play zoo who's in the green shirt um, is um, kind of tall and standing. So she's, she's watching her, I think it's her grandchild, she's watching her grandchild engage with the, the play partner and when they, when she left, then the grandma stooped right down. So she kind of was cute. She kind of took turns with the player. She was really enjoying watching her grandson um, be curious about the mud with, with his, um, the play partner. And then she was able to, to replicate that same behavior when, um, when the staff person left. So that was one of those markers that we kind of watch for. Are, are the parents able to feel comfortable modeling the kind of, or we're modeling the behavior for them? And are they able to, to replicate that behavior? Do they see it as a way to engage and position yourself and feel comfortable, you know, moving up and down. Same way over on the picture with the animal, continuing to look that the, the grown-ups are down low with the kids, um, doing that same kind of positioning behavior so that they're very supportive of what's happening for the children. Uh, certainly props are always helpful to give um, parents guidance on um, the kinds of things that are okay to do in our settings. Again, we're, we're comfortable with some of the, the play behaviors that sometimes Families might think are a little riskier, but um, picking up worms is what we want to be able to do, and then be gentle with them and return them to their their homes. That's a it's a really good behavior for a, for a parent to know that it's okay for a child to do. Thinking about the different ways our settings can um, can be uh, nature play. So I think we're, we're probably very um, comfortable with the, the gardening kinds of ways that kids can play, um, planting, caring for plants, selecting good place and form, thinking about do they like sun, do they like shade, all the things that, that they're, they're thinking that their plant might need. So that's that fostering, that empathy again, um, um, when they're able to care for, gently hold, gently place, carefully move, who else might they find living in that soil, um, all those kinds of experiences that can happen in those 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 rich play settings like, like gardens. Um, something that's a little harder for young kids with the gardens is that ongoing care. So, um, so there might be some sprinkling cans around for the kids to water the plants and come over and do that. We often have a rain barrel nearby, so then they get the message that we're collecting the, the water for their, um, to water the plants with. Um, and that's, that's a helpful behavior for a young child to be able to engage in, or any child really. The older they are, the more involved they can be with some of this gardening. Um, this is when we see some a picture of a mom at the bottom. Again, they're they're playing with um, they're doing a mud play experience and um, um, using different tools. This young child wasn't as comfortable touching the mud with her hands, so her first step was to use some different tools. Um, by the end of the play, um, the nature play activity, she was um, scooping and finger painting um, with mud. So, but for her mom, right off the bat, she wanted she put a smock on her. She wanted some tools. So again, meeting the parents where they are, you know, everybody's not going to dive into the mud um, experience right away. Some kids did, but this little one, um, her mom wanted her to have a, um, a smock on, and then she wanted to have some tools or some mediation between her hands and the and the mud. And and as as her mother was feeling more comfortable with watching her explore the mud, the you know the tools went down in the hands. I think she kept her smock on the whole time, but she definitely explored for with using her hands. Um, again, some picture on the right-hand side is just a, a ladybug release, and an activity that um, is one for our nature play programs that we, we try to incorporate on a regular basis so the children um, get to hold handfuls of ladybugs and think about where the ladybug's home might be, and they're able to place the ladybugs on the different plants um, and um, flowers around the, um, the area to, um, to make a good home for that animal and feel really confident that they've been able to hold ladybugs in their hand and think about the tickling and the, just watching their faces as they're holding those animals and then, then carefully selecting where they're going to um, have them play or live. 
after they're done um, looking at them and watching the move. So finding just some of those really firsthand, um, really authentic experiences that really young kids can have around many animals and then for sure with plants that they can do. So we take a, just a quick peek around a little bit of the play zoo, um, um, the kinds of ways, again, that nature play can look. So um, we see right in the middle picture, the um, hopefully you can see the little guy is right on the other side of a glass window where um, ring-tailed lemurs are. The costume that he's on, the little vest he has on, has a ring-tailed lemur tail. So when he gets up close and watches how that animal moves and how that animal um, lifts his tail, he'll climb around on the rocks on the other side of the glass and, and, and mimic many of those be same behaviors. So thinking back to those, those outcomes of fostering empathy and making connections and practicing caring behaviors, um, he's able to do at least two of those with that, that one activity um, by um, being able to play like the animal, put himself in the animal's shoes, so to speak. Um, for many kids, you, uh, we try to always have an art experience that it's a way for them to kind of be creative and play out their experience. These kids clearly are doing, now I don't know clearly, but it um, looks like they're doing something around stripes and animals that have stripes. And they've chosen orange and black, and they probably have seen animals at the zoo that might have those colors on their body. So it's a way for them to make a connection with the animals around the zoo. And um, maybe some of the crops that are just outside the picture um, might also be there for the kids to have a plush animal to look at or smaller um, resin tigers to build habitat for, and then to have that experience of stripes. Um, they're going to be um, probably very curious in noticing stripes on animals when they leave the play zoo and go out in the zoo to look at other stripes. This makes me think about one of the things we've learned from Children's Museum research is that that ride home in the car or that walk home pulling the wagon after the visit is a time for the families to talk about what they saw their kids do. While they may not be as engaged in the child's play, they're watching what they're doing, and that, that conversation on the way home kind of revisits um, the experience that the, the child just had. So we feel like we're, we're having those, those snapshots are being created the whole time the kids are involved in the nature play, and especially in, in more wild settings, um, parents are really getting some good um, feel. Are doing some exploring that we might risk close by, we can watch, but we're there um, supporting their um, their curiosity and risk taking in safe kinds of ways, um, like a balance beam or like building with boards that have they have ropes. So sometimes parents might be nervous about that, but with the right um, supports and people nearby, um, kids are invited to build boards and um, and do some of the same play behaviors parents probably did as kids without a lot of adults around watching what they were doing. So um, we, we often have conversations with parents about their early play memories, and fort building is one that comes up a lot. So we, we make sure that we have fort building opportunities for kids so they, they can do that. If they're not able to do that at their homes, they're able to do that um, in our nature play study. I think we're just going to continue to see some different um, ideas about thinking about invitations, thinking about placement, thinking about hands-on experiences, think, thinking about watching how young children really um, develop their confidence. So the little girl on the right um, in the kind of pink um, top is about to meet, uh, I think, a gecko. And, um, and sir, you notice that her arm feels like it's a little pulled back um, as the, um, the gecko might be visiting for about 10 minutes in this program, maybe 10 to 15 minutes. She's really curious and noticing it and not, not told to touch, not, you know, just invited to if she would like to put one finger on the gecko. She might not even know what one finger means. So she might watch her um, grown-up touch the gecko first and then, then develop her confidence. She might want to know the gecko's name, how old the gecko is, what the gecko likes to eat. So those sorts of um, connections between the child's life and the gecko's life um, are something that she'll, she'll we hope will take back. And if she meets the gecko again in another time she comes to to the play zoo, she may be more comfortable moving her arm a little more forward toward, um, toward touching that gecko. Um, again, thinking about your play settings being inspirations for the grown-ups to know um, conversations they can have with the kids about what they're seeing them do and touch and play, um, and just experience natural elements. So, um, we often use a lot of water with our nature play. Um, again, all, most Families are comfortable with not having to put a smock on when kids paint with water, and even water, kids love water, and the way water acts on a, on a tree cookie or on a bark, 
different different elf stones, river rocks are great for, for painting with water. Um, they can also we have we sometimes use clay pots just to get them to, to experience the texture of uh, some of these natural elements like shells and pine cones and sticks. So we pull those into the, the play as much as we can. They're not often items families have at home for play objects while they might have them around their house. So we use them in our um, in our play settings um, for kids to come upon and be creative with um, and touch and explore. Just some examples of um, some dramatic play, um, how that um, can provide an inspiration in, in your play settings. Whatever, if you are able to have costumes, we're always inspired by this story David Sobel talks about where he wanted to talk with kids about um, birds and the nest building and he, and he put out some um, uh, pieces of paper that the kids were able to build um, bird wings and then they put them on and they flew around and the next thing he noticed them doing was picking up grasses and building nests with them. So the inspiration that the children had from putting the wings on um, invited them to um, create, they already know that birds build nests. And so just by having that prop on becoming birds, they moved their bodies in ways that they felt like they were flying and scooping up um, uh, grasses and building some nests. So it really inspired some of that play. This little one um, is involved in a, um, a looking for um, animals that live under the ground in this play setting and um, she's got a ladybug costume on and um, she can flitter from, from flower to flower and look around but also dig down into the ground um, as part of the inspiration. Um, again, some, some of these pictures are showing the, the important, importance of our placement of our bodies as grown-ups in these settings to, to let kids know what, that it's okay to touch, that it's okay to explore, that it's okay to try out the different ways that they're um, noticing things in the environment and, um, and feeling confident about it. So um, as you're looking around at the play spaces that you, you're developing or you're designing or the, the settings that families are coming to for nature play, um, what is it about that setting and where do we need to kind of place ourselves to be invitations, to be supports, to be um, kind of ideas fostering for the way the kids are going to see the space? Because they'll watch our faces to know, is it okay to do this kind of thing? So we like to make sure that we're kind of in those areas and down low so that we're right there to be supports for them. Are we, have we advanced all these slides? Most of the slides, Monica? So, and I think this is just one of the kind of just a quick picture of the outdoor area um, at the, the play zoo. Again, it's not necessarily about having a play zoo for your space, but it, this is a pretty open area that has tarps and um, big branches and just um, stumps. This is where all the fort building happens at the play zoo, and, it, and the area kind of says that to the kids. We don't really, um, we leave the materials out as loose parts and invite that, that, um, that fort building as um, the kids and the grown ups. Um, play together. We just this year added some more um, um, materials, some more ropes and things out there that, that we'll place out when, when grown-ups are there so that, so that it's safe, but also that the parents can, can help the kids think about the different ways that, that that can be used to build some of the forts that they're building. This is, you know, critical. Play is the language children use to explore the world, and those adults who are able to speak that language of play send a strong message that the child's world and the way they come to know the world are important. Play is the, the first learning vehicle for us as young children and as we continue to grow up and learn, we shouldn't lose that ability to play and be creative and explore. Um, and that's what our Nature Play clubs are about, is supporting that, that with the, the, a family and a, and a, a group of family members um, and caregivers um, in our spaces. So how do we speak to all their, their interests and um, curiosity and enjoyment as they come to our play settings. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, Amy, are you able to see any questions in the chat box? Um, we have not had any questions yet, but I will actually go ahead and see if I can unmute everybody. Let's see. Be prepared. You're all being unmuted. Hello, everybody. 
<laughs> I'm going down the list. Right. Yeah, you can you can remute yourselves if you have a lot of background noise or something, but uh, please feel free to throw out questions, um, use the chat box or speak up if there are questions that you have for our presenters or for each other um, related to this topic or for me, um, anybody like that, anything like that, um, please jump in. Anyone? Hi, Audrey. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, if nobody has any, any questions or anything, I'd just like to thank our presenters uh, once again. Um, and thank you all for taking the time out of your day to, to join us. Um, hopefully this was uh, a great food for thought as you think about how you're best supporting all of your participants and your nature play programs and at your nature play spaces at your zoos and aquariums uh, to fully participate and feel empowered to take their nature play beyond their visit. Um, we will be posting this recording on our website as well as in the Nature Play group on the network. Um, and we look forward to um, another webinar will be happening in um, mid-January. So we'll be posting that date and the link and um, some additional information about uh, what we'll be focusing on there. So keep your eyes out for that, um, as well as our uh Contact information is here on the screen. If you have any questions or would like to follow up with any of us uh, for some additional information or questions. Thanks everyone and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you.